Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, and I'll be reading verses 26 through 35. And this is what it says. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter answered and said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night before a cock crows, you shall deny me three times. But Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Pray with me. Lord, this day, breathe your spirit through us that we might know your voice and follow and follow. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was about 114 years ago I became pastor of a small church in LaGrange, Georgia. I was a student at the time, and what the Methodist Church did is they, they grouped me together with some other student pastors. Once a month, we'd get together. We had a supervisor, and for several hours, the supervisor once a month on a Monday would help us out with sermons, help us out with pastoral care issues that we're dealing with, help us out with administrative things. A lot of what was done was we would share celebrations with each other and show our bruises. We were kind of fumbling through, and it was, a, it was a great time to come together. Well, I remember one particular Monday, a fellow named Jeff, his eyes were as big as saucers, and he said, you won't believe what happened to me yesterday. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, I started preaching. He said, and the back door of the church opened up, and this guy walked in halfway through my sermon, and he was carrying a shotgun. He stopped about halfway down the aisle, and he said, Jeff said, I could, I could, I could smell the liquor on his breath all the way down the aisle. He said, there he stood with a shotgun, and he looked at me and said, are you Joseph Lane's grandson? Jeff said, I, I took a big swallow, and I said, yes, sir. He said, this is all I wanted to know. He walked down and he put a dollar in the offering plate and turned around and walked out. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, that Sunday nobody was talking about Jeff's sermon. No, they were all talking about the offering that day. That was the talk. 
That was all they could talk about. It's all Jeff could talk about. You never do know what people are going to walk away. What people are going to walk away with. What they're going to remember. What's going to stick with You just never do know. You never do know. This night, it's the last night of Jesus' life. He's gathered his disciples together in an upper room. They're having the Passover meal. Every year at this time, They remember, they remember how God led his people from slavery to Pharaoh through the wilderness to life in the promised land. And they have certain symbols, things that they, bitter herbs that they remember the bitterness of slavery. They have certain symbols, things that they eat to remind us of this journey or to remind them of this journey in the, in the Passover. But but Jesus, Jesus adds something. He adds a cup and a loaf of bread. And he goes on to tell his disciples that night, on the last night of his life, he goes on to tell them that it's not going to be the sacrifice of a Passover lamb that's going to start this new covenant. It's his body and it's his blood that leads them not from slavery to Pharaoh, but leads them from slavery to sin through the wilderness into life. To life. Life in Him. Life that's eternal. Life that's abundant. And then the thing that, that I don't know, it took me a long time before I noticed it. Verse 30 says, And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Well, it's not just Matthew that remembered that. It didn't just stick with Matthew. It stuck with Mark as well. That afterward, they sang a hymn. Well, what is it that you sing when it's the last night of your life? What do you sing when you know you're being betrayed? What do you sing when those that you're closest to are going to deny even knowing you? What do you sing? Well, at the end of the Passover meal, they sang the same thing then that, that Jews sing now at the Passover, the great Halil. The great Halil. It's Psalm 136. They sang... From the old Jewish hymn book, the Psalms. And they sang Psalm 136. And it starts this way. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. On the last night of His life, Jesus sang a song of thanks. (laughs) On the night that He was betrayed, He sang a song of thanks. On the night He knew that they were all going to deny him, he sang a song of thanks. Well, I think Jesus has something to show us today. I think Jesus has something to show us today. And, and that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning, is singing a, a song of thanks. Singing a song of thanks. Howard Rutledge tells a story about a time in his life that he thought he had left the faith of his childhood behind. That is, until he was captured during the Vietnam War. He was put into a a prisoner of war camp, and there he was beaten, he was tortured for seven years. And he went on to say that it was in the the memory, the things that stuck with him through his childhood, the hymns, the Bible verses that he could pull from, that his faith was renewed. And it was the only thing that got him through the seven years of of torture, of suffering. And then he goes on to say, he says, the enemy knew that the best way to break a man's resistance was to crush his spirit in a lonely cell. All this talk of Scripture and hymns may seem boring to some, 
but it was the way we conquered our enemy and overcame the power of death around us. It's in the giving of thanks that we conquer the power of, of death around us. The giving thanks, giving thanks to God for what Jesus did on the cross for, for you and for me. Not because we've been so good, not because we deserve it, because He chose to. And we give thanks. Now it takes some practice in the middle of the suffering, in the middle of of the heartache, in the middle of the journey as as he, He leads us along the way. It takes practice. It takes practice to give thanks. The Apostle Paul, he knew his fair share of suffering and and. And he knew more than his fair share. He'd been beaten with whips. He'd been beaten with rods. He'd been stoned. He was imprisoned. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for you and me. I don't know that it's stated any more plainly anywhere else in the Bible. It's to give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Not for everything, in everything, give thanks. In the hardship, in the heartache, in the suffering. And on the last night of his earthly life, Jesus gave thanks. Well, it takes practice. It takes practice. And maybe what we'll take with us today is is that practice, that practice of thanks. The practice of thanks. But I not only wanted to talk about the singing of thanks, that it's, it's there in that, that song that's sung at the end of the Passover, the, this hymn that the, Jesus and his disciples sang together on the last night of his earthly life. They not only sing of, of, of thanks to God, that, that the great Halil starts in verse 1 with give thanks to the, to the God of heaven, to, Give thanks to to the Lord for he is good. But it ends, verse 27, with give thanks to the God of heaven. Because his love continues forever. Now that little phrase, his love continues forever. That's not just in the last verse. There are 27 verses in Psalm 136. And 27 times it contains that verse. His love continues forever. Sometimes I hear folks say, well, I don't like this new music, you know, because it repeats the same thing again and again and again. Well, if you don't like the new music because you evaluate it on its repetition, you won't like the old music either. Because in that that old Jewish hymn book, the Psalms, Psalm 136 sings 27 times in a row. His love continues forever. Well, you get the idea that, that... That you and I are supposed to sing what Jesus sang. Sing a song of of his love. Sing a song of his love. Theologian Dr. Carl Michelson tells a story about a time where he and his small son were wrestling around on the lawn. They were having fun tussling. And that's when Dr. Michelson accidentally elbowed his son in the cheek. He received the full force of, his son received the full force of his elbow, and and his father looked into his eyes knowing that it must have hurt. Well, the the boy was stunned by it, and Dr. Michelson knew that he was going to burst into tears, but that's when he saw in his father's eyes a concern, a love, a compassion. And it's what he saw in his father's eyes that that made all the difference. It's what's in the Father's eyes that makes all the difference. And that's why Jesus came. So we would know the nature. So we would know the love of God. And again and again and again, we see that Jesus healed. We see that He forgave. We see that he gave his life on the cross for you and for me. So often it is today that 
at best, people see a, a God that's detached and unconcerned, and at worst, they see a God that's venge vengeful and angry. This isn't the, the picture, the nature, the eyes of God that Jesus gives to, to you and to me. That on the last night of his earthly life, Jesus sang about his love that, that continues forever again and again and again and again. Now, that takes practice. That takes practice. But that's how we'll know what real love is. 1 John 4.10 says, this is what real love is. It is not our love for God. It is God's love for us, sending his son to be the way to take away our sins. So often, we get lost in, in, in this life, trying to figure out our feelings and our own importance and where do we fit in, and we lose sight of the Father's eyes and His love for us. That's what's, what's central. That's where our foundation comes from. That's how we know we're secure in this life. That He came. He came because He, he loves us. And we, it takes practice to sing of that love. And that's what Jesus did on the last night of His earthly life. When He was being betrayed, when He knew that those He was closest to would deny Him. It takes practice takes practice and that's what we're called to do to sing of his love to sing thanks and the great halil the song that they sang at the end of 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 the passover meal that it doesn't just sing of a, a, a refrain of thanks and and refrain of his everlasting love it gives the story of just how god led his people from slavery, that it talks about the guidance of God through the hardship, through the heartache, through the wilderness, to the life, to the life, to the life that he offers. Dennis Rainey is an author, an author who, who taught sixth grade Sunday school class. He talked about how in that sixth grade Sunday school class every year with each new class what he would do is he would he would break the class up into three s small groups and each of the groups he'd give a jigsaw puzzle he would dump out the puzzle in front of the first group and and to them he would give the box of the puzzle the second group he'd dump out the the pieces of the puzzle and he'd give them a box too but they wouldn't know it but the box wasn't the same as the puzzle was. In the third group, he just dumped out the pieces, giving them no box at all. He set one rule and one rule only, and that rule was no talking. Now began. Well, immediately the first group would go trying to match the, the box of the puzzle pieces that they had in front of them to the picture on the box. The second group they became frustrated because things weren't coming together the way that they thought it should there on the box. And they were frustrated that they couldn't talk with each other. And before long, they got so frustrated when someone figured that they didn't match, the box went flying across the room. And that third group, well, they never did try much at all. That they would always wind up bored, staring into space. And he goes on to say he didn't do it because he was a cruel teacher. He did it to, to let the class know as sixth graders, something that I think me, you, you, and, you and I might, might do well to learn today, is that like the pieces of the puzzle, as we all need help to bring order out of chaos, that this life, well, sometimes it, it's a puzzle to us. Marriage, relationships, time of heartache, time of suffering. That it's hard to bring meaning. It's hard to bring order. 
It's hard to bring understanding out of the chaos. And we need help. Jesus doesn't leave us alone today. No, He guides us through the wilderness. That when Jesus rose from the grave, He rose. He rose that He might guide us, that He might lead us, that He might speak to us in everyday, ordinary ways through prayer, through the coming together in worship, through singing, through singing the hymns of the faith. And through our sacraments. A few weeks ago, early one morning, I sat down to pray. And I was surprised. This this name kept coming to mind. It was a name of someone that I really didn't know well at all. It's a name from more than 30 years ago. Went to college with the fella. And I probably... Total time of conversation with this guy, I had spoken to him 10 minutes over the last 35 years. We had some classes together in college. I knew him. He knew me. Not well at all. But I kept getting this nudge, pray for him, pray for him, pray for him. Well, that's the way the Spirit guides, sometimes with little nudges. And so I prayed for him. Strange thing happened that my prayer began to develop as I prayed for him. And I prayed for him longer and longer. And at the end of the prayer, I remembered that years before, the college bulletin had, had talked about a, a new place where he was working, and I thought, well, maybe I could find him on the website. And sure enough, it had a, an email address for him. And so I shot him an email that morning. Strange as it sounded, I, it was just a quick two-sentence email. I sense the Holy Spirit leading me to pray for you this morning. Hope all is well. <laughs> At the end of the day, I received an email back from him. We had spoke a total of 10 minutes in the last 35 years. He said, for work, I flew to, to Florida this morning. He said, it required some difficult conversations. He said, while we were going through that, he said, things were going better than I could ever have imagined. And it came to my mind, someone must be praying for me today. He went on to say how good it was to know that when I got back to my hotel room and I opened up my emails, yours was the first one that I read. Well, Was it coincidence? For those who don't believe, no explanation is possible. For those who do, no explanation is necessary. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. And what God has given you and me is His Holy Spirit. A helper is what it's called. A guide. Someone who, who each day, every day, He leads us. He urges us. He nudges us. Sometimes through Scripture. Sometimes through the coming together in worship. Sometimes in the singing. Sometimes in prayer. And sometimes through our sacraments. Oh, it takes practice. It takes practice. Sing, singing about His guidance. Singing about his, his love and singing about His thanks. This morning, I don't know what you're going through. But I do know, I do know that practice Practice giving thanks. Practice singing about His love and practice. Practicing the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It can change a life. 
a life like, like yours and mine. And even in the most difficult times, He leads us. He changes us. He, he makes us into a new creation. One day, one step at a time. It may be that that this is brand new for you and that you've never invited Jesus to lead you, to guide you, and that that you want to do that this day. Well, I want to pray with you. Pray with me now. Jesus, this day and each day we need your guidance. Yes, in the hard time. Yes, in the suffering. Yes, in the joyful times. Yes, in the everyday, in the ordinary times. With the power of your Spirit, may we hear your voice. Sense your, your leading, your nudges. And that we might follow. Lord, it may be that at some point... We began to see your nature as one that maybe was detached or unconcerned or at worst angry and vengeful. And that there are folks this morning that have had a hard time turning to you and have not practiced singing of your love because they, they've been looking to the eyes of, a, of the spirit of this world, not your eyes. Not looking into the eyes of love, but into looking to, a, to the abyss. Lord, you tell us what real love is. It's not our love for you, but your love for us. Teach us this day how to sing, how to practice that love. Lord, Jesus knew what it was to give thanks. May we not just know it by example, but may we know it by practice. Practice. Practice giving thanks to you. You make us into a new creation. By thanks, by love, and by your guidance of your Holy Spirit. Start that just this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.